Yeah. Okay, so we are recording. So good evening. I'm glad everybody could join us tonight. So we've got Dr. Michelle Arnold with us this evening to talk about cattle health challenges and solutions to those challenges. Um, so she's all got all kinds of good stuff for us. And if there's questions, keep those for the end. We'll touch those too. Uh, but I'll let you go ahead and get started, Dr. Arnold. Sounds great. Thank you. Okay, so let's get started. Um, I, I'm talking about vector-borne diseases because this is the time of year that we see them. Um, it's usually in the fall. So vectors, as you can see there on the screen, and I'm gonna switch over to my laser pointer. Uh, the, the definition of a vector is an insect carrying a disease agent exposes an animal through biting or contact with mucous membranes. So why do they happen in the fall? It's because when the insects actually come out in the spring, it takes a while. It takes a while to build up, build up, build up. But finally, we get enough pressure, get enough insects and enough um, replication of, that, of those insects that finally we get disease from it. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting that way. That's why anaplasts, we only see that um, generally September, October. Uh, um, blue tongue is another one. It comes in a little bit earlier because of the, the different bug. It's a midge. So it comes in generally in August, maybe first of September. So we've got uh, several, several that we deal with. Um, we used to have grubs. That was one that, um, uh, you know, the, the flies, those flies would um, bite on the heels and then the grubs would come out on their back. But of course, we don't see that too much anymore because of the ivermectins. So let's keep, keep going here. First one is, of course, anaplasmosis. That's the one that we deal with right now in October. So when I hear <clears throat> I've got cows dying, mature cows dying, uh, and usually it's in more, usually it's more than one. They'll have several cows dying. It's almost always anaplasm this time of year. Ticks, ticks are the, what they call a biological vector, which means that um, this, this bacteria actually goes through some replications within the tick. So in other words, uh, without ticks, there would be no anaplasm because it keeps it alive, it keeps it going. Um, <clears throat> so, Vertebrates are reservoirs of the bacteria. In other words, it can infect cows. It can infect lots of different animals. So what you see here on the screen, you've got a cow that um, is infected. She's got anaplasm. All these uh, things here are supposed to represent red blood cells, otherwise known as erythrocytes. And the little dots on there are the anaplasmosis bug. So <clears throat> If a tick feeds on this cow, it gets the infected red blood cells, goes through some replications in the midgut, the salivary gland of the, of the tick. And then when this tick comes and finds another cow, a new host, then, then that's the way it's spread. That's the, the dominant way that um, anaplasmosis is spread is through ticks. It, it's, it is bloodborne though, so it can be through biting flies, it can be through using the same needle on multiple animals, because anytime you have blood transfer from one, from an infected animal to non-infected, it can move, move that bacteria. So ticks are again, the most important biological vector, and they call it biological because it carries out some of its life cycle there in a tick. And again, biting flies, hypodermic needles, you can have transmission to the fetus during pregnancy. So it can actually cross over the placenta. And there's a shot. That's why they had that picture like that. This is an actual blood smear. This is the red blood cells. And this is the anaplasma organism. Anaplasma marginale is the actual name, is the actual name. Uh, marginality because it's on the margin, on the margin of the cell. So this is one at necropsy, simple, simple diagnosis at necropsy because of several things that are unusual. You've got this thing here is, is the spleen. 
and the spleen um, in an anaplast cow is very large. It's it's close to that's probably at least five times normal size um, spleen. So what its function is, it serves as a filter for all the blood. And as blood goes through the spleen, the spleen picks out or identifies those infected red blood cells and pulls them out of circulation. So with anaplasmosis, you have lots of infected red blood cells. So the spleen gets huge um, just from pulling out all those, <clears throat> all those cells. The other thing that happens is as it, as it destroys those red blood cells, you get that yellow color. That yellow color is jaundice or icterus. It's kind of the leftover pigment after a red blood cell is destroyed. So we've got several things here. We've got this massive spleen and we have lots and lots of yellow. And that's in, and put that in a, you know, the month of September or October, and we've got a diagnosed. So it's, it's kind of a, one of these diseases where once they get infected, it takes a while before you're gonna see any kind of clinical disease. So if you think of this as being right here, day zero of being infected with this anaplasmosis. So by week one, it you know, starts to replicate, replicate week two. And then by week three, we're starting to get a lot of the red blood cells um, infected and destroyed. So, and it goes up pretty rapidly. By, by a month into it, um, you're gonna have a lot of the red cells destroyed. And when you get up here, like 40 to 50% of the red cells are pulled out of the circulation. That's when you start to see clinical disease, or that's when you notice that there's something wrong or you find them dead. Okay, so clinical signs, this is what you'd actually see. Uh, adult cows or bulls are dead in the pasture. So with um, removal of those red cells, let's back up just a minute, and that red cells job is to carry oxygen, carries oxygen to the tissues. And without red cells, <clears throat> can't do that. So they get what's called anemia. You're anemic when you have a low red cell count. And the signs of anemia would be weakness, um, you know, lagging behind, Things uh, like I've got here, isolation, lagging behind, staggering, they go off feed. Uh, they do usually lose a lot of weight. Um, they may collapse suddenly, may just fall down. Aggression is really common uh, because they don't get enough oxygen to the brain. So a cow that may be really docile and is easy to be around might come after you. Um, if you call a vet to do a physical, they find, uh, usually have some fever. Uh, looking for anemia is hard to determine, especially in a black cow, but they can have <clears throat> paleness around the eyes. I think probably one of the easier places to see it would be the teats, um, that they're not pink like they should be. They're gonna be really white. Increased heart rate and respiratory rate because uh, that blood is really thin. If you take a blood sample, uh, it seriously looks exactly like grape Kool-Aid, really thin. Um, and because of that, their heart rate's fast and their respiratory rate, they're trying to move oxygen. They're trying to compensate for the lack of oxygen. So they're going to breathe fast. Uh, you start to see that yellow mucous membranes by about day two or three into this. You start starts collecting. You might see see yellow eyes. That would be yellow in the eyes or um, um, in the vulva, that yeah, area of the vulva. Uh, constipation, rumen stasis, dehydration, those are kind of hard to pick out unless you're just looking for them. So this is how it's actually described, how many people have done this on, on their accession form when they bring a dead cow. Describe these um, affected cattle before they died as being off feed, shaky, um, swaying, breathing hard, runny nose, tried to get her to the barn, but she dropped dead on the way. Foaming at the mouth is a very common finding. Uh, fine one day and dead the next. But probably this last one is the one that, that um, I, I see most often. Eating one day, dead the next, 
had two other cows die in the last seven days. So that's kind of the history is yeah, I found a cow dead and, and then I found another one later that week. And now this is my third. And usually by the third one, they bring it here um, to figure out what's going on. So age is affected. Anaplasm is an adult cow disease, adult, anim adult animal. It's not a disease of calves um, because calves are making red blood cells really quickly. So they can keep up, even though they do get infected, they do get the disease. They don't get sick from it because um, again, they're, they, even though they get destruction of their red cells, they're making new ones. They're making new ones so quickly that it evens out. <clears throat> if it, like a two-year-old or a yearling might be diagnosed with respiratory disease because they're gonna have a fever uh, and a little fast, fast respiratory rate. Uh, so they usually get treated for respiratory disease and that usually takes care of the anaplasm. So it doesn't normally kill anything young. It's a disease of animals two, three years of age and older are the ones most severely affected. Again, September, October disease, we're going to run into a little bit of November, but usually not. Usually it's, it is over by the end of October. And we, by that time, we've usually had a good freeze and, you know, the, the, um, the vectors are gone. So after they go through the acute phase, let's say that they recovered or you got to them in time and got them treated, they go through what's called the convalescent phase where they're just um, trying to get back to normal again. So during that convalescence, if they're pregnant, they're almost always going to abort. That's almost always seen. Um, the, the, the young red blood cells, we call those reticulocytes, start to show up in a blood smear. They do lose a lot of weight, abort the calves, take them several months to get back to where, you know, they, they look normal again. So it, it, assuming that they uh, survive the acute, the acute disease, go through this convalescence, the thing to remember is they're always carriers. They can't get rid of that anaplasm easily. So they're almost always carriers for life. So think about that on a, on a laboratory situation. If you take, if you have a cow that has anaplasm, say this year, well, if you take blood from her next year, let's say next summer, she's still going to be positive for anaplasm. So, um, <clears throat> but if she's sick, it's probably not due to anaplasm. You know, it's just something we, see. it's, you got to be careful when you interpret um, laboratory tests. So I, I, tend to use more than one and more than one test to diagnose this disease. So it's persistent again, persistent. They go into a carrier state, even with early treatment, almost all animals will be persistently infected for life. So the big thing there is they can serve as a, as a reservoir for infection. If a tick bites an infected one, goes again and bites a naive um, animal, they're going to spread it. This picture is one of my favorites. Somebody sent me and said, what's wrong with that calf's ears? You know, they used to see these ears, how they're how turned down. This one too, sort of bent over. And I said, I have no idea. Said, did you look at the, what's in, at, and did you get them up? And they said, no, we just saw them like that. They thought it might've been due to hail. There was a, it had a bad hail storm. Well, they did eventually get them up and take a look in the ears and they were loaded with ticks. So, so you know, those kind of soft places like inside the ear and around the base of the tail that you're gonna see ticks uh, often on cattle. If you buy bulls, especially you know, coming from areas of of the US or even areas of Kentucky that don't have a lot of anaplasm. Most, so if you buy a bull that's uninfected, what we call naive, they're at added risk coming into a herd that's got, that's had anaplasmosis. Um, because bulls have lots of muscle mass, right? They're big, they're, they've got uh, a lot of size, a lot of muscle. 
takes a lot of oxygen for bulls to, to use to use those tissues. So they can die really quickly. They can die very quickly when they get affected with anaplasts. And if they do survive, oftentimes they're infertile for a year or so. So we can bear that one in mind. So it's always good, you know, to have uh, have those breeding soundness exams done on bulls prior to breeding seasons, things like that that you don't expect to happen, but you can tell that on a, on a semen evaluation. So treatment, let's say you've got um, a cow that's showing those signs, lethargy, lagging behind, um, and it's October, and there's really nothing else, more, nothing else that she's been into, um, injectable tetracycline is, and that would be your LA 200s, LA 300, just use the label dose. Um, be careful when you're getting them up to give it, because if you do get them to a point where they're running or you're forcing them to move faster than they want to, it can, it can cause them to die very quickly. Um, after, and, and I usually recommend to people, if you've got death loss in the herd, if you've already lost two or three, and especially if they've come here and had it officially diagnosed, go ahead and get everybody up, the entire herd, and give all the adults a shot of LA300 or LA200, whatever you have, um, as far as tetracyclines go. And because you really don't know what stage of infection the others are in. They may not be infected, but they might be. So it's just a good practice. Treat them all with LA200, start feeding CTC immediately. You can, uh, the CTC um, here is chlorotetracycline. It is a feed additive. You have to have a prescription for that from your veterinarian, so you can't just go get it. Um, <clears throat> but there's lots, they, they've got a lot of, of um, different products now that you can use. You can use arimacin, that's CTC. You can use minerals that are already made, like an anaplasmosis prevention or control mineral um, that's already made up so that they will consume the correct amount. So the question always comes, how long do I have to feed this mineral? So we, when you write, when a vet writes a VFT, the longest we can write it for is six months. That's, that's the longest they'll let us. So the, what I like to do is say six months starting in May, ending in November. And we'll cover it. That will cover your time. So if you can get a six month VFT, but the, the bottom line is you can take them off of it in November. There's also been some studies that said you, you, you could like keep them on CTC mineral for one month and then off them, with, kind of rotate them back and forth. Um, so if you're good at keeping track of things like that, that's another way to approach the, the feeding of CTC. So a couple of examples, uh, these are a little bit older. This is some of the original ones that, that had CTC in there. But the Bergman's a uh, you know, free choice mineral for beef and non-lactating dairy cattle. So it's free choice. You just put it out there and they are, the, you know, it's set that, that they'll consume the correct amount. But there are lots, I'm not picking on Bergman's. They've got one, and but I think all of them do now all the different uh, feed companies. And again, you have to have that prescription from your vet. So don't forget that it's called a VFD, the Veterinary Feed Directive. And they, so they fill out a form that, that you have to take when you, when you get the product. So there is a vaccine for anaplasmosis. Um, and you know, this is one of the good things that happened from COVID is now people understand vaccines a little bit better that um, vaccines don't prevent you from getting the disease, right? How many breakthrough infec infections have we seen with COVID? And same thing with anaplasm. Vaccine will hopefully make the duration of the disease shorter or maybe not even show any clinical signs at all. But it doesn't keep them from getting infected. So say, you know, all, almost all vaccines work the same way is that you're trying to build that immunity 
but it doesn't mean you're not going to get sick. You can just hope that you don't get very sick. Um, so same thing with this anaplasmosis vaccine. You have to get it through your vet. It is um, conditionally licensed. So it's not one that's like you're going to find um, at, in Jeffers or some catalog because you have to get it. Um, Kentucky's got the license, the, con the conditional license. But I'm, I'm almost positive you've got to order it through your veterinarian that he can't send it out um, to individuals. But nonetheless, very good vaccine, two dose series, four weeks part, give a yearly booster. Um, you can start it on all bred heifers and bulls. It's safe in pregnant animals. Um, so good vaccine. I guess the only problem with it is it's fairly expensive. And uh, the second thing is uh, they're always going to test positive. If you do a blood test for anaplasm, they're always going to be positive if they're vaccinated. And we can't tell the difference. We can't tell the difference. It's because they were infected or because they were vaccinated, which probably means literally nothing unless, unless you're either exporting somewhere like Canada. But the other thing that I run into is people selling, selling like registered animals and the buyer wants a lot of tests run. And sometimes they, they choose to have anaplas run as one of the tests. So they come up positive a lot of times that the buyer will refuse to buy. And um, so that's a, that's a downside of vaccine um, is, you know, if you do sell registered stock, be aware that your test is going to be positive. Um, but, you know, it has a lot of use. If you can't get a VFD for, for chlorotetracycline, vaccines about our only other alternative. And then if you are like organic, uh, organic production, you, you're not going to be able to use antibiotics. So that's where a vaccine is also, a, a, it's great that we have that option. So again, the vaccine does not prevent infection. It controls clinical disease. So we hopefully will make it where they don't die and they really don't have too many symptoms from it. So vaccinated animals may become infected. They do become carriers, but they don't get as sick. And they will seroconvert. Again, they'll be positive after that second dose. Here's another good shot of that yellow color. It's really vivid. Um, it's almost like dial soap color. And another shot of those blood cells. I, I, I like this one. As you can just see, see all the little organisms around. So this would be early. And this is one of the things we can do diagnostically. It's if we get a blood sample in, we can do a smear and look for those organisms. Um, it has to be what we call purple top, um, a, a purple top tube, not a red top tube, because all the, all the different blood tubes have different additives in there. Well, the, the purple one, keeps the blood from clotting. And that's what we have to have in order to make a slide like this. So yeah, that's another good way to diagnose is, is with a blood smear and look for the organism. All right, so let's shift gears just a little bit. We talked some about ticks. Um, so this year, actually up in your area, we had, um, the, we had um, a case of a cow that died, it was, it was a young cow that died from anemia, but it was due to ticks. And it, this, this animal was infected with what we call the Asian longhorn tick, which I'll show you some pictures here in a minute. But the, the phone call I received was, you know, we've got a, I've got a cow out here. She's literally covered in ticks and she was getting weak and, and basically she died just from blood loss. So this is the Asian longhorn tick, and I am not even going to try to say that. I think it's hemophysalis hema, hema or something of that nature. I'm not too good at the tick names. But you can see it, it's almost got like a helmet on its head. And that's the way they identify um, the, this new tick. So 
just a couple of pictures from this one that came to the lab, how they just swarm. They're um, <clears throat> just thousands and thousands of them all over, you know, all over this animal. So again, this is called the Asian longhorn tick. Um, it does die if you use um, a pour on, like a pour on um, in a dewormer that's got the insecticide in it, or if you use just a straight insecticide, it will get rid of these ticks. So um, <clears throat> definitely need to have something on board to get, you know, that's going to get into the bloodstream and get rid of these. Uh, the bad part about this, here's another good shot here from the ear. The, the interesting bad, whatever you want to call it, is that female, female longhorn, uh, Asian longhorn ticks don't need a mate to produce eggs. They don't need a male. So they can, they can, that's why they, they're so prolific and they can swarm like this. Um, I don't need a male to reproduce. So kind of keep your eyes out for that. Um, this, this tick um, has, and an, it's actually new to the United States in the last few years, but in, in other countries, it's been linked to this, this bug, the Stylaria orientalis, which looks a whole lot like anaplasmosis. So um, we've not diagnosed this yet in Kentucky, but it has been in Virginia and West Virginia. So I guess we're just, um, our, our time will probably come. Clinical signs similar to anaplas. Again, they get anemia, fever, and lethargy. They occur in the fall, but they also can have some time in the spring. So it's a little bit different that way. Um, Animals have acute disease, are persistently infected. Hopefully this will not become a problem here, but with, with this tick, uh, you know, just now coming into Kentucky, it's just too, too early to say. Uh, Michelle asked me to talk a little bit about pink eye because it's always on, uh, it's always on everybody's list of uh, most aggravating cattle diseases. Um, because it's just doggone hard to prevent. And, and it's obviously, it, it lowers the value. It lowers the value of your calves if they've got scars in the eye. But uh, and it's, a, it's just an aggravation all the way around. We know that the, the primary organism is that Morxella bovis, the bacteria, it's covered with these little pili, which are hair-like structures that help it grab onto the cornea, it, it does its damage because it releases a toxin or a poison that kills the cells on the surface of the cornea. So that's why they get those, those ulcers in the eye uh, is because of that toxin that kills those cells. One of the reasons this, this bacteria is so hard to deal with is it forms what's called a biofilm. So they're, they're finding out that bacteria can, can somewhat communicate. And um, so these bacteria kind of get together in these, in these biofilms and they communicate with each other. They're gonna stay covered. They're gonna stay in that, um, in that film, which you can't get antibiotics through it. We can't get the cells in there that the white cells that should be killing that bacteria. It kind of they're protected in that. And once they get their numbers big enough, then they can go. Then they let loose and cause the damage. So lots of new new discoveries going on with bacteria. But basically, this biofilm makes it is probably one of the main reasons that pink eye exists and is hard to deal with. Because the bacteria, we can get it out of healthy eyes too. So it's usually there. You know, it's usually there. There are other factors that are involved here. Number one is going to be injury, injury to the eye. So if there's some type of injury so that the cornea is not normal, that gives that bacteria a way to, to grab on and stay connected. So that's kind of where we have to put our minds when, we, when we're thinking about pink eyes. How do we keep those eyes healthy? 
or what what is what would be the things damaging the eyes and how do we keep that from happening one of the primary ones is right here you see them that's why I have this picture here is the face fly so these are face flies they are not the same fly that you see on their back these are the flies that that um all they do is go right up there in the corner of the eye and they that's where they feed. They're blotters, they blot up tears. But but the way they make the the way they make the animal tear is they scratch the cornea. They have kind of rough, rough pads on their feet. Those flies go up and scratch that cornea and make make them kind of make them have fluid come out come out of the eye and then they blot them up. They blot up those tears and that's the way, that's the way they get these flies or get their nutrients. So they're not blood suckers. Um, so think about the implications of that. Most of our fly control is through the blood. You know, we'll pour it on their back or spray it, but we, but, but then the fly spray gets absorbed into their system goes into the bloodstream and that's where um, that's where you actually get get the, the flies to die that are on the back that won't work with face flies they don't they don't suck blood so here's one that's not a surprise to anyone <laughs> is that pink eye is not the same every year this was a big this was a great big study they did uh, over several years well 83 to 2001 and you can see the incidence rate really changes and it's like that i mean that's that's it, some years it's terrible some years it's it's uh non-existent so i mean that's just the way that 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 pink eye is you'll see you'll have a peak generally what happens if you'll have a peak one year and then it goes way down the following year and then it go back up again so why does that happen this bacteria was really going to town right here and then the animals, the, the cattle built up immunity to it, made antibodies to it. So the following year, bang, they didn't really have it. So well, how does the bacteria respond? It's going to change itself. So the bacteria will mutate. Those, those little pilly change now on the surface. So bang, here we go again. Go, goes back up again. So it's kind of back and forth. You'll have a bad pink eye year and then the cattle will make antibodies that are pretty specific and back down it goes. Well, then the bacteria changes. And again, we see, we're seeing this all with COVID too, that you know, it changes in response to what we do uh, so that it can live. That's the way that, that bacteria and viruses survive. They change so that they can survive. All right. Risk factors, some of these we can help, some of them we can't. Uh, ultraviolet light, sunlight, causes cell damage to the cornea. Um, it's why the, it's one of the reasons why uh, pink eye is so much worse in the summer. It, it does damage the cornea. But also remember this, if we have snow, if we have snow and the sunshine is bright, you can have some damage to the cornea from that too. So it's not just, summertime that we have that strong UV rays. You can have it at other times of the year. There are other bugs we a lot of times find alongside more excella. Mycoplasma, IBR is a virus, listeria. These are all these are all bugs that can affect the eye and, and make it make it more susceptible to having pink eye, but these are not causes. These are not causes of of pink eye itself. Again, we talked about face flies. They feed on eye secretions. They're a vector. Talked about that from the beginning. This vector of spreading bacteria, animal to animal. And the, and the female face flies irritate the eye with those sandpaper feet. Sandpaper like spines on their feet. Mechanical irritation or physical trauma or injury to the cornea from pollen, seeds, feed dust, dust, thick stemmed hay. Thick stemmed hay, think about that. People say, why would I get pink eye in the winter? Well, where do they stick in their heads in when they go into that bale of hay? 
to eat, has, if it's really thick and stemmy, definitely can damage the corneas. Uh, host factors, so age, usually, usually it's more common in young calves. Uh, I think the, the age range is somewhere around 45 days to like 150 days is where the most common, most commonly hits. Um, breed, we all know it, it's Herefords. Herefords do have a, 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 a higher incidence of pink eye. Nutritionally, if there's selenium and copper deficient, also really much more prone to have pink eye and, and difficulty recovering from it. So that, that hits you two ways. They're more likely to get it and your treatment is less effective when they are deficient. So Herefords, one of the reasons that, that um, they are more, more likely as a breed to get um, to get pink eye is they have many of them have what we call an unpigmented conjunctiva, which is which is this area here. It's not this, it's not this, not going around the eyes, this part, the white. You see here how how it, it is very white all around the eye versus this one. You know, this eye, look at all that pigment in there, brown pigment. So that's protective. You know, that brown pigment really protects the eye from you from sunlight. There are other factors in there. Herefords, even if they have some pigment, they still are more prone to pink eye, but, but they are as a breed working on that, working on trying to um, genetically change this where they, they have more pigment and hopefully have less pink eye. And give them, just talk about the face flies just a little bit more. Um, they do irritate the eyes. They cause those superficial scratches in order to increase tear production. But, but face flies can carry that bacteria that causes pink eye in its crop, you know, it's in its throat and actually regurgitate it two to three days later. So it's not just a matter of moving moving the bacteria from one eye to the next on their feet, it's also that they're carrying it for days. So <clears throat> it's not an easy bug. It's not, this is not an easy one to control because face flies are hard to control. The fly numbers increase during the summer. Face flies only spend a very short time on the animal, something like 98% of the time a face fly is not on the face. It's usually on a fence post or on a tree or somewhere like that. It spends 2% of its time on the animal. Reinfestation from neighboring, neighboring herds is likely. If you use um, fly control like a, you know, like a feed additive, um, you, can still get, you can still get adult flies from the neighbors. Um, and the last thing is the chemicals we use to control flies have to be applied to the face. And if you apply it on the back, it's not gonna do any good. So these fly control chemicals have gotta be applied on the face in order to control face flies. So, so just a couple of differences here. So the horn flies, those are the ones on the back. And of course they do lay their eggs in fresh cow manure. They can fly about three miles. This, this slide is from um, Dr. Townsend, Lee Townsend. He's retired now. Again, these uh, horn flies, they, uh, they are piercers and they suck blood. They spend 95% of their time on animals. So easy, easy to get these treated because they spend so much time on the animal. Face flies, again, shorter, shorter flight range. They are blotters, so they drink up tears. They don't suck blood 95% of their time off the animal. So I was a little bit off there. I said 98. It's 95% of the time off of the animal. And the adults live in, you know, on, again, in barns, on fence posts, um, but, but not where we're going to be able to treat them. So the feed additives, again, they're, they're good for face flies if they're labeled for it. Um, Altacid is one of those that's not. 
Alticid is one of the more common ones, but it uh, is only labeled for horn flies. Raybon, uh, face and horn flies. Clarify, clarify, I should say, is just labeled flies. So we're not exactly positive that that covers uh, face flies too, but it should. Rules of thumb for these, start them early. If you don't, you're wasting your time and your money. They should be started 30 days before flies come out. And continue those all summer. Don't remove them till 30 days after the flies are gone. So that's the 30-30 rule. You want them to consume it daily. You know, so keep it out there. You've got to have daily consumption of this of these um, feed additives. And again, it does not control adult flies. It only kills what's in the manure. So if uh, your neighbor is not doing anything about flies, they can definitely fly over to your place, the adults. So we still have to use some kind of adult fly control. Okay, vaccines, here we go back to the vaccines again, not 100%. Um, and so vaccination boosts the antibody response. So they fight the disease more effectively. That's all what all vaccines do. The key with, with pink eye vaccine, I think a lot of times why we don't see much from it is because of timing. Um, it takes about four weeks to really develop antibodies to pink eye vaccine. And most of these vaccines require two doses. You need to have the antibodies in place before pink eye starts, and usually it starts sometime around the 1st of June. So, you know, if you think back about that, uh, most directions, label directions say the calf has to be two months old before you even start it. So the calf's got to be two months old and it takes two doses, um, takes four weeks to develop antibodies. So you're looking at, you know, if you do a two month old calf, it's at least three months old or older before they've even got antibodies. And so by that time, a lot of calves have already been infected. So timing is, is important. Vaccines don't always present the right antigen, the right thing, the right, um, it is so, it's not always, the vaccine's not always got the correct target. So even though you give a vaccine, sometimes it just really doesn't work. A good example, that's the flu. Flu vaccine is a shot in the dark, basically. I mean, they, they make the flu vaccine a year before um, and hope that they get it right when we get to flu season. Pink eye vaccines are somewhat similar in that we hope we get it right. You know, you're trying to hit that antigen, but it might not be because the bacteria is just good. It's good at changing itself. The homemade vaccines are the ones that are uh, made from, uh, from cases of pink eye like, you're, you know, like on your farm. Those are called autogenous vaccines. Sometimes they're successful, but not consistently. Um, you got to still make a new batch every couple of years uh, because, again, that bacteria will change with time. So this would be your diagnostics. If you wanted to have a vaccine made or you wanted to figure out if there was something, something um, different about your bacteria that was causing you trouble, you can get this done as a culture where you just swab the eye down here, down in this, what that's called the conjunctival stack right down under there. Um, you want to swab it when it's, that's actually too far. You want it right when it starts, when it's just starting to water. Um, they should be untreated. You don't need to have any antibiotic in them when you take this sample. And then um, there's a couple of different ways it needs to be that it can be transported. But you know, if, if you're going to do that, you need to talk with me or talk with a vet to so get get the right samples sent correctly. Um, you can do everything right, but if you don't. If you don't ship it right, it's, it's worthless. So approach to pink eye, how do I, this is how I look at it. You've got to manage what you can. 
manage what you can control or at least try to. Um, face fly control is essential. Making sure you get that chemical on the face. Good nutrition. Make sure you got plenty of trace mineral. Lots of clean water. Um, I, I can't emphasize enough that if you have your cattle drinking out of a pond in the summertime and that's their only source of water and it's a small pond and they're standing in it as well, that is not a clean source of water. And they just don't drink very much of it. Um, they've done study after study about that, that dirty water, dirty warm water in particular, cattle don't like it and they're not going to drink it. So think about that for yourself. If you don't drink water, what dries out? One of the first things on me is my eyes will dry out. Um, and dry eyes lead to problems because then you get, then you can get injuries pretty easily. So make sure you got plenty of trace mineral, a good trace mineral. Make sure they're eating it. You know, if you put great trace mineral out and they don't eat it, um, it's the same as not having any out there. So make sure they consume it. Control sources of injury to the eye. You can dusty stemmy hay or dusty feed, um, mowing tall grass or weeds, making sure there's some shade available uh, that they can get out of the sunlight. You can work with your vet to determine uh, bacteria involved and how you want to approach it. If you want to make a, a vaccine or, or you know, maybe you want to do, um, you know, find out the bacteria and find out if um, maybe you need to change antibiotics. Those kind of things we can do. Treatment, if you, to, to get the best result on pink eye, you have to treat it early. You just have to treat it early in the process. Um, Antibiotics, LA-200 or LA-300, Draxin, those are the ones that we could almost always depend on, but doesn't seem like they are working as well. Um, and we've got uh, the Morixella bovis is the one that causes pink eye. There is a second bacteria called Morixella bovocula that's also been found in a lot of pink eye cases. And that one seems to make it harder, harder to treat. Um, so if you don't have success with your tetracyclines, your LA-200 and 300, and maybe Draxin's not working either, that's when you're gonna wanna start looking at some other um, antibiotics like New Floor seems to be very popular, um, Exceed. But basically get one that's got some, some duration of action. Uh, if you're going to use some type of cream, you can get those creams with cloxacillin in there. Uh, used to be people would buy mastitis tubes, the cloxacillin mastitis tubes, and use that in the eye. I don't know how available those are anymore, but, but they were effective. Injections, subconjunctival injections of penicillin work well. Um, Again, you can culture the eye or do PCR to determine the bacteria involved. And then um, we can figure out, plate those bacteria, figure out which antibiotic would, should work best. I'm always asked about patches or that it's important to cover the eye. Patches are good and bad. Um, they shield the eye from sunlight. They can keep it from getting dusty and dirty, but it also, keeps you from seeing what's going on behind that. Um, so if the eye is not improving or it's actually getting worse, with a patch, you won't know that. So I, I personally don't like them, but I think if you put them on lightly and they come off pretty quickly, that's probably all you need um, as far as, pat, as a patch goes. You don't want them on there for a long period of time. Uh, bad cases, I would suture the eyelids together or do what's called a third eyelid flap, which keeps that cornea from breaking open. You know, so I'm actually losing that eyeball. But that's not something that I would advise you to do as a producer. That's a, that's a good job for your vet. Um, if you can't use antibiotics for some reason um, and you need to use it, uh, for, for example, if you're organic production, Vetresin pink eye spray. Um, 
it's effective if used according to label and, and their label says space three sprays in the eye applied twice a day. Uh, if you get a chance, this this YouTube video is made by Vetrison and it talks about how to spray. They want you to spray it three times in the eye at different angles and again, applied twice a day. And I think if you were to do according to label, that, that actually would work pretty well. And then there's lots of home remedies, salt, uh, salt on the eye, I'm using WD-40. There's a lot of them out there. So um, salt's a little bit brutal. If you've ever gotten salt in your eye, there's nothing that stings worse, but it does make the eye water. And of course, salt and uh, salt's good for killing bacteria. So you can, you can imagine it does work and it does work well. So when they talk about um, a subconjunctival injection in the eye, so uh, I talk to producers and they always want to give a shot like under the eyelid here. And that's really not, not what they're talking about. Um, you look at an eye right here about the end of this red arrow is where you'd want to give um, an injection in the eyeball. But it has to be just really, really superficial. You don't want to go in, in towards the eye. Um, the, the, the conjunctiva right here is almost like, um, it's almost like cling wrap, you know, like the, like the, like the stuff you put over a bowl. It, it's really thin. So you want to just barely poke your needle in under that, under that conjunctiva and put the, and put your medicine in. So if you're gonna do it, if you're gonna give them a shot up here under the eyelid somewhere, don't bother. Just give it sub Q, you know, in the neck. Um, so because there's no difference. If you give it up here under the under the eyelid or give it in their neck, you're gonna get the same result. <clears throat> but given these um, injections right on the eyeball is different. That's a different situation. The the medicine just sort of slowly leaks out. Um, of that little pinhole, that little needle hole, and keeps the eye bathed in, in medication. So I hope that made some sense. All right, so we're going to finish up. I was thinking about things that um, we see this time of year besides anaplast. Uh, plant poisoning is not really, really common, but we do see a few cases every fall. Um, this is when I think about plant poisoning. There's, there's no other real cause out there. Let's say um, uh, an animal is presented here at the lab and I'm talking to the producer and they literally have ruled out everything else. You know, we, we, it's not anaplas. They've already tested for that. Um, you know, they don't know what happened. So but problem that occurs in a healthy animal Usually they were healthy one day and sick the next. Uh, some kind of recent change in the diet, like turned in, turned into a different area or turned into a new field a lot of times. Uh, and it could be simply a change of season. Poorly managed pastures, if the animals are hungry, they're more likely to get into some poisonous plants. So this is when we see every, every year, at least one or two cases is buckeye. And of course, this time of year, this is when all the buckeyes are dropping. Um, so it does cause a neurologic problem when they when they eat the, the buckeyes and, and they become basically drunk. They're, um, they don't want to move. They're kind of stiff. Uh, they might have tremors. Uh, they might hop. But I'll, I'll tell you what, the number one thing that gets it for me is if somebody calls and said, my cow or my calf did a somersault. They went head over heels. I can almost promise them there's a buckeye tree somewhere because it's one of the few things that'll do it. Um, they don't all die. They do not all die from buckeye poisoning. Uh, if sometimes, or actually often, they will recover uh, from this and within about a day. It's, it all depends on dose. It all depends on how many they ate. So just a few is going to make them pretty drunk. They ate a whole lot. Um, five pounds. Five pounds for a 500-pound calf is lethal. 
So that's quite a few, um, quite a few buckeyes to eat. This is a picture, this next is a picture of one that came in the lab, so obviously a dad. Uh, and look at the number. I mean, you look, there's tons of buckeyes in here that they ate. And of course, in those situations, it is fatal. Sometimes we did have one case, we didn't see any buckeyes in the room, and, but they had fallen, uh, the fruit had fallen in a watering trough that was under the tree. So, um, uh, and that toxin that's in a buckeye is actually water soluble. So it came out in the water and, um, and killed some of the cattle. I think that's the last, the, my last um, slide tonight. This is another one we typically see in the fall is this perilla mint or purple mint. Um, this plant grows, tends to grow in fence rows, uh, in shady areas. So uh, close to the woods a lot of times, but um, the flowers there that you see, the flowers and the seeds right up in here are, are the really, really poisonous part of this plant. Um, <clears throat> They get what's called, if they eat this, they get what's called acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. Um, and it's this sudden and dramatic onset of severe breathing difficulty. So it's like a really good picture. She's got that head stretched all the way out, trying to move some oxygen in her nose. Her nares are flared open, she's slobbering. Um, uh, she's actually standing, usually they stand with kind of a wide base stance. They're just trying to move air. They are literally trying to move air and their, their lungs just won't allow it. It's like a bad emphysema where the lungs just are, are, are not moving. So <clears throat> these most of the time will die from, from perilament. Not a whole lot you can do, actually, if you see you get one, they, they're really, they don't respond well to treatment of any, of any kind. Um, dexamethasone would be just about as good as anything. But uh, nonetheless, so if you see something like this, you might want to look around, get rid of the, get rid of the weed, at least mow it down or get them into a different pasture. If they, some, some of them get kind of a taste for it. So um, that would be something you just need to be aware of see something like this, look for that purple man. It's pretty common, pretty common weed. So preventing problems, at least as far as poisonous plants go, and not overgrazing pastures makes a huge difference. Uh, animals avoid weeds if they have plenty to eat. Um, so, you know, we're, if we're getting to a point where the grass is short, don't be stingy, get the hay out, you know, get the hay out and start offering it um, so that they don't have to go eat things they're not supposed to. Uh, remove the cattle if you're spraying herbicides until the target plants are dried and dead. 2,4-D is notorious for making um, weeds taste good. So I don't know if it makes them salty or what, but um, so you don't want to have men where you're spraying. Uh, let the let those plants die, turn brown, and then you can turn them back in. Thicken your stands up to compete with weeds. Oh, my lights just went out. <clears throat> Thickening the, the grass stand to compete with the weeds so you don't get as many weeds. That's going to be beneficial. Uh, look, monitor your fence lines. If you have neighbors, and especially now where, um, you know, a lot of the suburbia is moving out to what used to be rural farmland. A lot of people don't understand what's poisonous and they dump things over the fence that they shouldn't. So taking a little time to tell the neighbors don't throw anything in the pasture um, is hugely beneficial because sometimes they'll trim their bushes and they throw it all over the fence and that's how we get a lot of death loss. So educate those neighbors not to feed, not to feed the cattle. They, they don't, they don't need to be fed. Um, strategically fencing off areas is needed. There'd be a time, for instance, if you had a lot of buckeyes or a lot of acorns in the woods, you might want to fence off some of the woods, at least until the, at least until the nuts are gone and then turn them back in. So 
think that is my last slide. Yeah. And there we go. We can come back and take any questions. You might got to turn my lights back on. Hang on. I got to go back out and pull <laughs> to get my lights on. Ah, there we go. Okay, much better. Any questions? It looked like you were in a cave for a second there. I know, I felt like I was in a cave. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just one, to of strange, uh, one of those odd deals at a certain time, I guess eight o'clock, the, um, um, the electricity, or they cut all the lights off in the building. You have to go hit a button. To turn it oh, back on. So. Ours are motion activated, so if you don't move around or anything, it turns them off. So every now you got to kind of jump around to trigger it again. <laughs> <laughs> so there, are there any your, questions? Yeah, go ahead, unmute yourself, or you can type them in the chat box too. So if you haven't used the chat box before, just go to the bottom of your screen and just click chat. It should pop up right there. Oh, we've got one. Um, says great presentation. Possible to get copies of slides. Sure. Uh, so we did record I can, it. I can send those to you gladly. Wonderful. Wonderful. Everybody's going to beef bash tomorrow, right? <laughs> beef bash at the Versailles farm. Um, I think we started 8.30. Is that right? 8.30 or 9. I think it's 8.30. Oh, I it think is it's registration, okay. I think. Registrations, I think, at 8.30. But... I think the lectures, yeah, eight o'clock registration begins. We start talking at nine. So. nine. Yeah. Well, it looks like a really good lineup. A lot of good stuff. Most of it forage related. You know, most of it has to do with the research they're doing on the farm. So a lot of the stuff on the toxic fescue mitigation, which is a big deal. I mean, it really is. You have a uh, we have a lot of really hot fescue that, that makes them overheat. And have one case this fall I know of, and it happens every September, I never really put it together that we'll have feeder calves going west and have two or three die in the truck, you know, from overheating. Um, and when they shouldn't have, you know, it's not that hot and they got plenty of air and they have plenty of room. But, you know, go back and look at, at the pasture they were on and sample it. And that ergo baling was sky high in it. Mm -hmm. So they just couldn't cool themselves. You know, they got much, much hotter on the trip west than they would normally. So anyway. That's like something that's easy to forget about, but there's a it's ton of it. Because people think, well, they just got their winter coat on. That was the that was what um, they kept telling me was well, they just got their winter coat. And it's said, well, did, did the ones across the road have their winter coats? Well, no, they didn't. And so, well, that, you know, I think the weather's the same on both sides of the road, so it's probably not, <laughs> it's probably not the winter coat. So, yeah, it's, um, but it's That's easy to say, I mean, it looks like it, you know, they got that long hair and they're hot, you know, they're hot. And, um, and the other interesting thing about them is they don't poop a lot, you know, the, the, the ergo veiling causes that vasoconstriction and the rumen gets full of really dry um, rumen contents. They don't urinate much and they don't have a lot of fecal materials. We recommend giving a cap with pneumonia. I'm currently using LA200. Um, probably need to go something a little stronger. You know, Draxin's a good one. Draxin's a really good antibiotic for pneumonia. Batrol, most of them are prescription though. You're going to have to get um, get them from a vet or for somewhere anyway. But it not but it, in other words, you can't just buy them out at the store. Draxon's good, Batrel's good, um, the new ones, Zactran, Zuprevo. Uh, Draxon's now in in uh, generic form, so it should be a whole lot cheaper than it used to be. But there's a lot out there. Anything else? I kept y'all a little long. It's eight o'clock already. Well, we started a few minutes late. So. <laughs> <laughs> Any real-time public sites that show ongoing real-time health issues in areas? Uh, the, actually, on a, 
on our website. If you go to um, UK, UK VDL, which stands for the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory. So you go on our website and it has a, an epidemiology link. I'm not sure if I can get it here. Um, let's see real quick if maybe I can get it up. Um, uh, let's scoot this over. Share it. Um, can you see that? Can you see our website there? No, uh, if you well, hit wait, share, wait, 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 I didn't hit share. That no. always. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there's our um, website. And this epidemiology information, you've got animal disease distribution maps, and you can go to bovine maps there. So um, it just depends on what, what you're looking for. You know, these are the diseases that we're going to look at things like, um, let's see, say bovine necropsies with final diagnosis. Maybe that should be good. So, you know, here's your, um, your map and you can mouse over, you know, mouse over your county. We got 21, 21 in boom. And um, that is, it usually tells you that's for the current year. Um, how many deaths per month. So that's looking at necropsies. There's a, there it is on a historical basis. But if you, you know, if you want to do, um, I'll go out of the way, let's see here, let's go back here. So if you let, let's say you want to look at anaplasts. So there's where our, oh, we kind of got our hot spot this year. Um, this is positive blood test. Um, and that's for the year. So here's, now again, this is blood tests, right? So blood tests, you can do those basically anytime. It's not really an active case. These, this would be uh, cows that test positive. So kind of, anyway, you can kind of mouse over your um, county and it gives you those numbers. You need to just play with it though. There's, there's a lot of information um, on that site. So again, this is just our UK VDL, um, our UK VDL site. That's about the only one I know of that has that. Anything else? Am I missing anything? Um, I think that's got it. Yeah. See, the only other thing I was thinking, is there anything that you've seen this year that you would recommend people to start doing? Like, is there something new coming in that they should know about? Hmm. Nothing. I, I can't think of anything in particular that that's new. Um, we, we still always have the same old problems. We still, <laughs> we still need to address the old ones. We still need you know, to feed mineral. We need to feed trace mineral. Uh, we need to make sure get the hay tested before winter and make sure that you're meeting their nu nutrient needs. We've got just a certain set of problems that happens all the time. Uh, trace mineral deficiencies, uh, feeding poor quality hay and not supplementing with something else to meet their nutrient needs. Um, th those two are big. You know, if, you take, if we take care of the little things, then we'll get a lot better response out of our vaccines and so, so forth. You know, vaccines are way down on my list of things that need to be done. First, we gotta take care of the animal, meet their nutritional needs, meet their needs for water, and, and then we can start thinking about vaccines and things like that. So, and, and, and the other thing would be just buying. You know, if you're gonna buy cattle, just, be aware of your source, you know, where are you buying these from? And if you're buying them from some, somewhere where you don't have any idea where they're coming from or what they've had, you, you better treat them like when you get them on your farm, you don't wanna just turn them out with everything else. You know, they got to have some time. We, we have learned that with COVID, you've got to have that quarantine time in order that if you're incubating a disease, you're not gonna spread it. 
It's the same thing with cattle. So I see that one. That, that, that mistake is made probably more than any other. Buy cattle, even if you know the source, buying cattle and bringing them home and turning them out with everything else and not taking that period of time to quarantine can really lead to a lot of problems. And that's something to consider too, if you're renting bulls to turn Yes, out. renting oh. bulls, same deal. Um, make sure that they could their quarantine, get, get you a, a, a breeding soundness exam done. Make sure they're fertile. Um, make sure if you're gonna rent bulls that you use Vibrio in your vaccine because Vibrio is sexually transmitted by the bull. And so, you know, rental bulls, you don't know where they've been. You don't know what, what they've been breeding. So they can bring it home. Um, Lepto's another one. Lepto's another one the bull can spread. So yeah, there's, there's definitely considerations. You gotta be, you got you, you can't think, you can't be that worried about it where you're just gonna worry about every little thing. But take, again, take care of the things you can take care of. You know, a quarantine period, doing your vaccines, you can't prevent everything, but at least you can, you can do what you can do. Yeah. And Dr. Arnold, well, I just saw it in cow country this week, but there's a really good list of vaccines on there. If you're not really sure where to start, <clears throat> that's a really helpful list there that you put together. Oh, and nice. pack it to work through. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I use it. <laughs> so I think it's, I use it too. <laughs> I think, and the, and no joke because there are new ones all the time. They're, they're, coming out with new ones they change names they pull things off the market so that i try to keep that thing current for myself too because um I, you know like again they do change and the companies change so just keeping up with that is is quite a bit yeah and sometimes too you know if you're interested in selling in some of those preconditioned sales They've got a pretty good checklist of what you need to buy too. So if you're looking to get started mm -hmm. in that, they pretty well have a, a pretty good to-do list of which one yeah. you need to buy. It's cookbook. Yeah, it's almost like a like a cookbook of um, you know, they give it give it a certain time. These vaccines a certain time. I I'll have to say Zoet is is probably the worst one at it. They don't they don't give you really nice guidelines. As opposed to like Merck and BI, they really lay it out. Boy, this is when you, you give this on at a certain time. So Edis is a little more, um, I don't know, they're a little, a little more flexible, but they've got so many different products. Makes it harder for them. Yeah. And if anybody has questions on that stuff, I'm happy to work with you. And if I don't know, I asked Dr. Arnold. I feel like I hit her up quite a bit. So uh, if you're not sure where to start, just ask. I mean, we're happy to help you with that too. All right. In so, a reminder, we do a breeding soundness exam clinic every April, our Cattleman's does. So if you don't have facilities at home to, to get your bull checked, that's not a big deal. You can haul them in. Um, there is a discount to Northern Kentucky Cattle Association members, and you can join that day if you want. Um, but it's a really good opportunity to get them checked. That um, is a great opportunity. I mean, that's uh, that's kind of unusual. And it's not something you'll see it in every state. And um, it's it's really worth doing. Yeah, I mean, every year there's been a ten percent rate that didn't pass. That didn't you know, pass. whether and most of the time it's damage. It's not that they were genetically, you know, something wrong. They got hung up in the fence. They got hung up in the field. But some some reason or another, they were not producing enough to be able to get cows bred. So, right. mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, count up how many open cows you have each year. I think that pays your twenty five dollars pretty quick. <laughs> pretty quick. I mean, that's a bargain. Twenty five dollars. Most of the time, that's I've seen it go up. You know, a couple of hundred. So, yeah, it's a really great service. You know, and mm -hmm. I'll do a shame a little shameless plug in too. We offer free soil testing, free hay testing. At the office, same thing. We've got the probes. We've got the equipment to get those samples, and um, we've we've got all the tools that you need. So hit us up, and we're, and we're, she'll interpret the results for you too, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's, that's important. <laughs> it's like, what do I do with this? You know, it's like, yeah. I want to know what to do with those results, and yes. and that's all great. I mean, that's a, just a tremendous service. 
I, I think so. I mean, I just, I wish more people used it. So I, so I try to I try to promote it as much as we can. Right. Okay. Well, I think I'm going to go find some dinner. If, um, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> if all right. We, we got all of the information. Okay. And I'll send this to you here in just a second. Okay. That sounds great. So thanks for everybody to logging on tonight. And I hope you learned something and we'll, uh, we'll have the recording posted here before long. And we'll be back to normal. We'll go 